Welcome. You're ready to receive this morning? Yes. yes. Don't, we don't let the weather stop us from coming and being in the, in the house of the Lord together. Amen? Amen. 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 We're so glad you're here. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. We'd be happy to provide you with one. We want you to see the word for yourself. So important, so important. And we're living free and living for the Lord in 24. I'm going back to 23. Both of those were good, though. <laughs> living for the Lord in 24. Amen. Amen. God is good and he's doing great and mighty things in this place. Amen. Take your Bible in your hand and say this with me, please. This is my Bible. By faith, I am what it says I am. By faith, I have what it says I have. And by faith, I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I place a draw on the anointing to come forth through this woman of God. Woman and woman. <laughs> it's a Indestructible, indestructible, ever living seed of the Word of God. This seed will continue to grow up as a tree in my life that delivers me from all afflictions. I fully expect to see the Word confirmed through miracles, signs, and wonders inside and outside of the church. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. God is good. We should never be the same. We should all be transforming as we're living for the Lord in 24. Amen. So the Lord gave me this scripture just a little bit ago, which is good for the times that we're in. Romans 5, 3 through 8. We can, in the New Living, it says, we can, too, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Is that good? Good. That's so good. And, and we know we're living in perilous times. But we have the love of God shed abroad in our whole heart by the Holy Spirit. So we can go through whatever trial, whatever's going on around us, we can walk through it. We are free. Amen. Stand on your feet. We welcome those who are watching Hallelujah. online, what we do here, you do there. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you and praise you for this day. This is a day you have made. We will rejoice in it, and we thank you for your love that's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And, Lord, that we, that we will walk, we will live for you in 24. We will walk in the freedom that we have in you. And we lift up this service. We thank you that we will receive everything that, we have, that you have for us today. That our hearts are open and receptive to your word. We bind any weights, any distractions, anything that might hinder your word from going forth. And we will walk out of here never the same. We lift up those watching online, Lord. And we thank you that they will receive what they need this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come Hallelujah. on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Shoes on. Come on. It's okay to clap. There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Rhythm of a gospel song. Once you choose it, you can't lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I got a heart overflowing because I've been restored. There ain't nothing gonna my joy, no, there ain't nothing gonna steal my 
wander Turn the mountain that I can't climb You are with me, yeah, but lead me There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy
Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. Has he broken chains in your life? Amen. Has he set you free? Well, share that with one or two other people as you greet them. Amen. Welcome to Real Life Church. Thank you, Jesus. We welcome everyone listening on the internet. We believe you're going to receive from this service today. No matter if you're here or not, but it's always better here. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. If this is your first time here, um, hopefully you received a newcomer's packet. And there's a card in that packet. If you'll turn that in to one of our ushers or into our bookstore, we have a free gift we want to bless you with. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you ready to give? This is our building fund Sunday. And so this is an offering just for the building fund. We'll be receiving the tithes and offerings at the end of the service, at the end of the ministry. Uh, part of the service. And so um, if you need an envelope for your building fund, please raise your hand so we can make sure you receive one. And we're, we went over last month about what the building fund is for and different projects we've done. Uh, and we are actually, you know, we've got a list. And there's people in the church that keep adding to the list, you know. <laughs> rightfully so. There's not, I mean, just saying, you know, rightfully so, because there's a lot of improvements that we want to do. Um, so anyways, um, I want to read a scripture to you. This is out of Ephesians chapter four and verse 16 says, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working, which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now notice up here, it says from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. There's a supply that you are to bring. Yes. Yeah. Amen? Amen? For the growth of the body. Yeah. Everyone in here has a, has a supply. And it goes on and it, and it says, according to the effective working, there's some work that all of us are supposed to be doing. Yeah. And he says here that it's effective. Yeah. When we're led by the Holy Spirit doing what God called us to do in the body, then it's effective. Yes. Amen. Amen. Oh, so, you know, the lack of response, I, I take it, maybe I'm wrong, I take it as maybe some of you think you're not being effective. Well, I did this and I don't see any effects. You know what? You may never see the effects personally in this life. You may never. My wife and I were talking to a group of teachers last week and, you know, the Ray Bolt song, Y'all, somebody really looking at me, who in the heck is Ray Bolts, right? <laughs> right? Ray Bolts, and, and uh, he, he talks about, you know, a man going to heaven, and he didn't think his life meant much of anything. But he got to heaven, and all these people, you know, the, the title of the song is Thank You for Giving to the Lord. Do you remember that song? Yeah. Well, you know, I believe that when we get to heaven, we'll see the full effect of our work, the full effect of what we supplied. Amen. Amen. But let's not be discouraged while doing good here, but just because we don't see it for, with our own eyes. But I'm telling you here, I'm speaking to you directly. You are having an effect. If you're working in the body of Christ, in the church, doing anything, you're having an effect. You know, people that walk out of those doors say, man, I felt love. This is the most loving church on the planet. You know, Pastor Kurt, Pastor Terry uh, say that all the time. Amen. You know, it's not just words. Right? Yes. It's, it's actually having an effect. Amen. You didn't get that. Yes. The words that have been spoken are having an effect. Yes. It goes on and it says, um, according to the effective working by which every part does its share. You've got a, you are a part and it's time to do your share if you haven't already done it. And the share that we're to give is, or to do is not just a one-time thing. You know, it's called living for the Lord in 24, right? Not have lived, right? Well, I have lived. Well, what happened to your living? Because, you know, anytime we stop living for the Lord, we have stopped living. You understand this, right? The, the moment that we depart from the Lord or say, I don't want to do anything in the church, I don't want to have anything to do with the things of God. 
we have stopped living the true life that God intended us to live. God has called you to be a part of this body. He's called you, and, and the reason he planted you here is not just so you can fill that seat so that, you know, somebody, you can claim it for your own, right? It's actually so you can be effective, so you can affect not just this body and not just this community, but the people that we reach around the world. Amen? Amen? Amen. And part of the building fund actually supplies that. That is, you're, you're part of that supply that's, that actually blesses people around the world, that blesses the children, that blesses the building itself, that blesses the property, that provides so that we can, you know, actually, I like it when the grass is not knee high where we can walk through it. How about you? Right? You know, that, that takes somebody cutting a lawn, and that takes money to pay for gas, pay for the, the, you know, the whole effort of cutting the lawn. All those things. There's a lot involved in the building fund. And we want to actually expand here. We, you know, we've got some plans for new classes. And, you know, those are future plans. I wish we could have them already done. How about you? Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And so we, we would love to have a bigger sanctuary. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Because there's more people that could be affected or be ministered to by this ministry. Yeah. And so part of the building fund is funding those things. And so if you have a heart to give, mm -hmm. amen, bow your head and close your eyes, lift your offering up to the Lord. And if that is you, say with me, say, Father, thank you that I am blessed to be a blessing. And I am a blessing today. As I give into this building fund, I believe that it will be a, an effect. It will be a work that will cause great growth to the body. I thank you, Father, that I am doing my part. I'm giving my share. And I thank you, Father that you're honoring this gift that I'm giving from my cheerful heart. I delight in my giving. I thank you that I am blessed so that I can be a blessing. And I thank you for multiplying this seed as I sow it. I thank you. I will receive a harvest in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, ushers, you can receive the offering. Now, don't forget, we've got a few um, announcements here. Our mission here at Real Life Church is to make and marshal disciples who know Jesus and love and live like Him. And we're living for the Lord in 24, and we're glad you're part of our journey in doing that. Uh, just showing up here is part of that journey. Amen? <clears throat> well, I listen online. You didn't get it all. Amen? You know, there's an impartation that takes place in person that you cannot get anywhere else. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Core Youth Ministry. That is, that is today, right? Today at 1.30. Uh, and so we're excited about that. Change your life. Grow in the Word. Make and develop friendships. Lots of fun and activities. And food, too. That's always a good addition. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, March 10th is our membership class. And if you have not become a member of Real Life Church, there's a sign-up sheet in the back back there on that table. If you'll put your name on that list so we can include you in that and make sure that, you know, we prepare for, for everybody that's going to be there. That is going to be at 1.30 um, after the service on March 10th. And then the following week, we'll be receiving the new members as well as having a baptism out. Now, you don't have to be baptized because you're a new member. That's a separate deal, amen? I'm just saying. Uh, but we will be having a water baptism on the 17th. And no, you know, they won't let me, you know, dye the water green or anything because of St. Patrick's Day, but because they don't want everybody turning green and so, okay, fine. All right. So anyways, we're going to have a water baptism after the service on the 17th. Join us after each service uh, for food and fellowship, light snacks back there. And if you'd like to volunteer for any ministry here, there should be a sign up sheet. We could use some help in their children's ministry in different areas. So Please make sure you uh, actually seek the Lord about those things. Ask the Lord, where do you want me to be? Where, what do you want me to be involved in? Yeah. Amen? Amen? Just sitting there is not good enough for Him. Amen. You're not earning anything, but you're not being useful for Him. Amen? Or in His kingdom, if you just come to church and sit and do nothing. Amen? Amen? Amen. We're an active church. Amen. We're a living church. Amen? Amen? Let's stand on our feet and worship Jesus. our hearts for the word of God. Lord, we just love you love so you. much. Love you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
praises from a grateful heart. Each time I think of you, the praises start. I love you so much, Jesus, love you so
good Lord and that that never changes even when we make mistakes even when we do stupid stuff Lord your goodness your goodness Lord and we celebrate your goodness and we celebrate your love and Lord that we would walk worthy of your goodness and walk worthy of your love and Lord that we would be living demonstrations of your goodness 
Lord, that takes us renewing our mind to your word, seeing ourselves the way you see us. And Father, we make a commitment to do that very thing, that we will live for you more than we ever have before. Little steps every day to be everything that you've called us to be. And Father, we're not where we want to be, but we're not where we used to be. And we're grateful for the progress you've made in our lives. Lord, we give you honor and glory for it. Now today, Lord, as we speak, Lord, I thank you that this message will be milk to some and it will be meat to others. But in all things, Father, you will be glorified. And that when we speak, we'll speak as the oracles of God. When we minister, we'll do it with the ability that you supply. That in all things, Father, you will be glorified. Lord, we also thank you that every single person here and every person that listens, listens and watches online, Lord, that they will be hearers of the word and not, they will be doers of the word and not hearers only. And that deception is broken off of us and we yield to the spirit of truth. And Lord, we make a commitment to do the word of God and we give you honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Kurt Owen. I'm married to the pastor. Which is a total blessing. And who are you, ma'am? I'm married to Kurt Owen. Which makes you the pastor. This is Pastor Terry Owen. Amen. The, Amen. You might want to. Now, my wife thinks it was a rough service. Oh, no. Y'all should just be happy I'm here today. I, I heard the spanking we all got on Wednesday night. I listened online, so my toes didn't get crunched as much as y'all's did. But, but anyway. It was a I good would, service. I would go listen to it. You should listen to it, because Jesus heals all wounds. You know, it wasn't that rough. It, I thought it was pretty rough. I thought, wow, they're going to be happy to see me. Praise God. <laughs> You're hilarious. No, it was an excellent word. It just, uh, it was, it was just... Uh, Somewhat corrective. Yes, amen. Let's go to 2 Corinthians three sixteen through 18. We are living for the Lord in 24, Amen. And there's a lot that we need to do in order for that to be true. <clears throat> and, um, you know, before we get into this, go ahead. Let's, um, first, let's take authority over every sickness and every disease. Amen. There's been some infirmity trying to run loose and stuff. Now, we're going to exercise our authority, yes. but then you have to exercise your authority. We do have a rod and a staff, one to protect. Uh, and one to guide, but on the other side, you actually have to do the word you're hearing as well. Amen. But we're going to join our faith together that we as a body, that we are not going to yield to this sickness and disease yeah. right. and that uh, all these different things that keep popping up need to now be you, broken off of y'all. That need to be broken off of y'all. Okay. And us. On the yeah. other side of it, you've got to stand <clears throat> up and exercise your authority as well. Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we honor you and we glorify yes. you and we thank you, Lord that it is clear that it is your will that we be healed and whole and free from every sickness and every disease. Your word says in the 103rd Psalm that it is one of the benefits to walking with you, that you have forgiven all of our iniquities, that you have healed all of our diseases. And Lord, we make a decision to yield to you, that you are the Lord that heals us. Yes. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we command every spirit of infirmity to be broken off of our people individually and off of us as a church. We command every sickness and every disease to, to be turned off now in your presence on the inside of us. Lord, we thank you. You, the God that lives and dwells on the inside of us, raises up and quickens our mortal body and drives sickness and disease from our midst. Yes. Bodies, you listen to us. We're talking to yes. you. Be free of every sickness and every yes. disease. Be free of every pain. Yes. And we refuse to relent. We will not get tired in fighting. We will fight back. And we will not yield to sickness and disease. Not as individually and not as a body. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. One other thing, because i got to ask this, I think on Wednesday night. And so I covered it a little bit, but I'll cover it again just for you guys. Um, because of what happened at um, Lakewood. Lakewood Church last, uh, last week with the active shooter and stuff. All right. Statistically, if we were to have an active shooter, they would come through the front door. 98% of the time, that's what happens. 
So they would end up coming through that door right there more than likely, okay? In the event that somebody was over there that, that was close by, that you could tackle them, we're all good with that. But in the event that they make it through the door, we're going to ask everybody at that point to get down on your hands and knees and start crawling towards an opposite door. Don't try to go to this door. Try to go to that door. Stay in between the seats. We want you down on the ground because our response team here at the church is going to respond to the threat. Okay, and um, it's incredibly hard to shoot when a bunch of people are moving around. Now, we do drew drills to do that, but we need you down and out of the line of fire so that you are, we don't end up hurting you in the process. But we will address the threat and put them down. Okay, a uh, man cares not for his own family's worse than an infidel and is denied the faith. We love you guys and we will take care of you. We will look after you. But the easiest way for you to do, if he doesn't, people say, don't we trust God? Pro Proverbs says that the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. We will prepare the horse for the day of battle, but we still trusting our deliverance to be in God. But we are not going to ignore either. We're not just going to say we trust God and fail to prepare the horse for the day of battle. Neither are we going to say, well, we prepared our horse for the day of battle. We're good. No, because our deliverance is of the Lord. We're going to walk down that middle path. By the way, in uh, Mark chapter 3, Jesus says, uh, as the crowds began to grow, Jesus said, I ask you to keep a boat offshore, lest the people throng me and crush me and kill me. He had a natural means to protect himself. Obviously, that came from the Father because he didn't do anything he didn't see the Father do. And so we are perfect. If our Lord can have something there natural to protect us, then we can too. And you matter to us. And, um, and so just know that we are, that is the plan at this time. You don't have to worry about the kids because we, uh, we have a response for that. And we're, I'm going to be training more people. I'm going to try to slow down um, after Peru next month. I guess. I'm going to Turkey next week on Sunday. Um, but after that, we'll start having training sessions. If you'd like to be part of our church safety team, you will be welcome. Uh, the training is free. Um, uh, you will be trained really in world-class techniques. Uh, some of the best people in the world come to train with these techniques. Uh, but we'll get you your medical training and also how to deal with an active killer. Okay? Yeah. Okay? So if, and if you have any questions about that, you can ask me or, or uh, Minister Curtis. But that is the plan. We will take care of your kids. I understand the concern. My daughter's back there as well. I guarantee you that they're not getting there. So you guys get down um, on the ground on your hands and knees, crawl the opposite direction. Now, if for some reason they were to come in the back, crawl towards that door, but stay down out of the line of fire, and it'll be over in seconds, okay? So um, <clears throat> if that's all we ask of you, okay? All right. Anybody got any questions about that, I guess? All right, I love you. All right, so let's <clears throat> let's get into the scripture. Yes. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians three sixteen. We're going to go through eighteen. It says, "Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away." Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so as we're talking about living for the Lord in 24, we're getting down on the inside of us that we're being transformed, right? This is a process. We know that it's a process. If you go back and listen to Wednesday night service, Pastor Kurt talked about the process and why we had to save our soul, have to have our soul saved, right? That your soul is the one thing that continues continually has to be saved, that when you get saved, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your spirit man is recreated, you are a brand new spirit, you are brand new, you are made perfect in the image and likeness of God, but it says that we have to have our souls saved, right? And so we've seen that in James, in uh, James chapter 1 and verse 21, it says, Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul, 21. And so we know that we have to have our soul saved. And Pastor Kurt went into great detail on Wednesday night about why our soul needs to be saved, what it means, what our soul is interacting with, and the need for us to have our soul saved. We have to come to the realization that what you're thinking, what you're feeling might just be wrong. Well, and there is no might to it when it's contrary to the word of God, right? Yeah. It is wrong. All of us in here think something that's wrong, 
feels something that's wrong and wants something that's wrong. And the only way to correct that is to allow the word to save our souls. And you have to do it with meekness because you have to understand that I'm wrong in some areas. All Amen. of us are. Amen. Right? So today we're going to talk about, <clears throat> well, the last few weeks we've talked about that we need to tend to the garden of our heart, right? That the kind of heart that we have is going to determine our harvest. It's not, it's not the seed. The seed is incorruptible. The seed is perfect. So it's the condition of our ground, the ground of our heart. And so we talked about that at great length. And we're going to talk today, um, we're going to go to... We're going to go to Mark chapter... Let's go to you want to go there first? first? Yeah, to Proverbs that. 23, 7. And you can start... Well, let's start in verse 6, actually. Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor de desire his delicacies. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. Then it says, the morsel you have eaten, you will vomit up and waste your pleasant words. Um, okay, so here's a guy that is uh, very affluent, and he has a lot of delicacies, but he does not see himself as affluent. He doesn't see himself that way. And regardless of how he's treating you at that moment is not the reality of who he is. The reality of who he is is the way he thinks in his heart. And he thinks in his heart, that he does not have resources. So what's going to happen is he's going to force you to give back all this stuff because he sees himself as a poor man. He will cause you to vomit up those delicacies. Now, again, the, the key to this is as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Say this with me. As I think in my heart. As I think in my heart. So am I. So am I. Now, here's the thing about that. This is true in healing, it's true in prosperity, it's true in peace, it's true in any truth of the Word of God. One of the biggest problems that uh, people have in receiving healing is they don't see themselves healed. They do not think healed, they think sick. There is no mental picture, there's no, there's no heart thought that this is who I really am. Right? Remember and we what need, James said. Yeah. And we need to change that picture on the inside of us because honestly, when your body is talking to you, it is very hard to use your imagination for something contrary. It becomes, it becomes a struggle because all that you can feel is the pain. All that you can think of is the pain. And so in order to have that shift, we have to have our soul saved. We have to renew our mind too. But I am healed. So we paint a different picture on the inside of us. Right? Because if we see ourselves differently, that's how we're going to respond to situations. And see, I can say all different sorts of things, and right now I can be thinking one thing, but the reality of what the way I truly think is going to come out when I get under pressure. Right. Right? That I can be sitting here having all these nice thoughts, right? I can be sitting here uh, and saying all these nice things, but we're really going to find out what we really believe when all hell breaks loose, yes. right? And so, the, the, but I, I would prefer to wait. I don't want to find out what I believe in the moments of pressure. What I want to do is begin to uh, intentionally and on purpose change the way I think in my heart. I want to receive with meekness the implanted word, which will save my soul, which will cause that. I want to begin to intentionally and on purpose plant the word of God and spend time thinking about it, not, not just reading it, right? But thinking about it and acting on it. The more you act on it, the more it becomes a part of who you are. And, and the same is true with finances. There are so many people who have finances and yet don't, they still have a poverty mentality. They still see themselves as the opportunity for lack is right here. And if I let go of this, then this, this is going to hurt me instead of help me, right? And, or I'm not going to have enough. You know, it, it's remarkable that our three-year-old is very good at sharing. She doesn't have this mindset that there's not more available. And, and we as children of God need to understand there's plenty available. We just need to learn that it's ours, 
right? So to shift out of that, because if you've had lack, if you've had, if you've had sickness and disease, if you've had experiences contrary to the written word of God, then we have to actively on purpose change the way that we see, to change the way that we think. I, I had a friend one time who, uh, believe, supposedly believed in prosperity and everything. And he ended up, he had a lot more money than what I had. But when I went to go see him, actually I was helping him move, he had more Cool Whip containers than any one man should ever have. <laughs> Which means he'd eat more, you know, Cool Whip than any one man should ever have. But he had, um, honestly, probably several hundred Cool Whip containers. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I, I, when I opened his cabinets, right, the bottom ones, all it was was stacked, stacks of Cool Whip containers. And there, there's not enough stuff in a hardware store that you would ever need this many things, right? There wasn't enough stuff in his house. If we could have broken it down, we could have taken everything in the house, put it in Cool Whip containers, and still had Cool Whip containers that were empty. There was no reason to have this many Cool Whip containers. But still, even though he had money, he was not prosperous because he thought he still had a lack mindset. I've got to hold on to these things. Everybody with me? And you have to begin to change that. Because some, uh, this is a lot of times as people begin to get money, uh, okay, I'll, I'll just tell them myself. There have been times I believed God for finances and the finances came in. And then I didn't want to use the finances on what I was believing for. Some of y'all are looking at me so spiritual. No, I, I believe God to, uh, for finances to come in to pay a bill. The finances come in and now I don't want to pay the whole bill because I don't want to let loose all the money. Right? And, and again, even though I believe what the word says in my head, some point I have a lack mentality. I don't be truly believe what the word says because now I'm not wanting to let loose of this money. I think that this, I got to hold on to it because what if I don't get any more? Right? And see, that, that's telling me that no matter what I'm preaching, Though no matter what I'm saying, the way I, no matter even in my head what's going on, what I truly think in my heart is I'm not going to have enough. And I have to change that before it costs me. Are you here? Because we get very practiced at saying one thing and believing another. We, we get very practiced at that. And, and we have to break that practice because what we do is we deceive ourselves, right? Because now if we can't believe what's coming out of our own mouth, if you, if you give your word on something, but you know you have no, per, no, no intention of fulfilling that word, right? I'll just cancel later. No harm, no foul, right? Well, but there is, because if you can't believe what's coming out of your mouth, how are you going to be able to believe God? It's all a word, right? And so we can deceive ourselves. But as you're thinking in your heart, so are you. Go ahead. I dare you. Ask my daughter if she's a princess. <laughs> she knows she's a princess. This morning we said to her, you need to put on your white tennis shoes. Why? I want to wear my princess shoes. <laughs> i tell you the thing that really got me the other day, and this has nothing to do with this message, but it was funny. I was trying to correct her, and she looks at me and she goes, you should not be afraid of your toddler. <laughs> and I said, I am not afraid of you. I just want you to do what I'm telling you. But it was... It was <laughs> She's three, just so you all know. Of course, she redeemed herself this morning. I walked in, and she goes, you're handsome. <laughs> all right, all right. You want a pony? I'll get you a pony. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you have, you have to begin 
to see yourself in light of the word. And, and when you see something in the word and you act contrary to what you're seeing, you're actually not believing the word because your actions are telling your, your whole body, telling your soul, your heart, I'm saying this, but I don't actually believe it. And, right? and let's just throw this out there, okay? And Pastor Kirk can clean this up. But a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways, right? And let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. And so what happens is we get really conflicted. We're trying to believe one thing. We're saying, we, we could even be saying the right thing, but not believing it, right? There's, there's so many ways that this can become a tangled web, but an unstable man is not going to receive it because we get double-minded. And I just, I'm just going to leave that there and let that... Kind of sick. Yeah, and, and this is something we have to deal with. And understand that the principles of God work. So if all of a sudden they're not working, we can't look at God and say, what's wrong with you? Why isn't this working? We start have to go back and see how do things work. And, um, and one of the biggest problems that we see is people are not tending to their heart. They're not protecting a heart. We talked a little bit about this last week, that you, you have to keep this in the midst of your heart. Right. And then, listen, you don't have to wholesale begin, you know, 100 percent of your actions, but you got to start. You'll never because some people say, well, I'm changing. I'm never doing this again. Yes, you are. I mean, because uh, you're, it's just like anything else. If you have a habit, right, it's going to take a while to break that habit. But you have to start when it comes up little by little making the choice that I'm not going to think this way anymore. I'm not going to be this way anymore. Are, are you with me? Yes. And just make, make the one choice today. Don't say you'll never do it again because then you're going to beat yourself up when you do it again. <laughs> right? Just say, listen, I'm starting to implement this in my life. So when this thought comes, I'm going to replace the thought. When I start to act this way, I'm going to replace the action to line up with the word. I'm going to act on the word that I hear. Okay. Now, break it down. So, one, we have to hear the word, right? Amen. We have to hear the word. So, that is us reading the word. That is our speaking the word. That is us putting the, heart, the, the word of God into our heart, putting, keeping it in the midst of our heart, right? So, first, we have to hear the word. Let's go back to that Proverbs 4.20, where we were. Proverbs 4.20. Mm-hmm. My son, give attention. So you actually have to give your attention. That Your attention is something that you have that you can give. Give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my saying. Every, almost everyone in here is old enough to remember <clears throat> when E.F. Hutton listens or speaks, people, right? And th there was like, there was all these com commercials back in the day that some of you young people are looking at me, don't know what that is. Anyway, and you, you, there's like all these people, oh, E.F. Hunton's listen, we're going to, they're talking, we're going to listen, right? What, because there was something, they were, they were having an expectation that they were going to receive good information, good intelligence. And so there was an inclination of our hearing. And the thing about this is, if you're not giving attention to the word, what are you believing that's keeping you from doing that? Why, why is it you think you don't need that in your heart? Why do you think you don't need it? I think, was I here that I taught on this or was I on te television about how with the word of God that I didn't, um, God asked me, he, says, you don't, he said, you don't believe that's the word? I can just tell you. You said it Wednesday, I think. Yeah, Wednesday. I, I said this, and you can go back and listen to it. One day the Lord says to me, he goes, you don't believe that's my word. And I said, no, I do yeah. too. That's your word. And he's like, no, you don't, because you're not giving place to it. If you truly believed it was my word, you would make sure you were in it. Yeah, right? I mean... It, it, in a sense, it's, it's like um, the karate kid, right? If do right, no, no can defense. Well, then I'm going to learn that, right? But if that works, then I'm going to spend all this time, even when I'm not being trained to do that, I'm going to spend all my time doing that. Remember, do y'all remember the karate kid, right? 
right? Y'all are not that old, even, I mean, but what happened was, is he's being trained, but he sees this technique, and his instructor said, what? he says, what is that? And he goes, uh, crane technique, if do right, no can defense, right? And so though he's training hard every day, independently he's training in the crane technique because he believes his instructor and so he's giving all this time effort and energy to learn this if you believe if do right no can defense it doesn't matter what else is going on you'll take the time to do it right and and again don't get beat up because i, I just told the story about where he tells me you don't really believe this is, is, is the Word of God. Because if you believe that you needed this as bad as you do, you would make time for it. Okay, I'll just tell something that happened the other day. Um, Tuesday. Thursday. Thursday. Um, so I got up late um, because of uh, Victoria getting up in the middle of the night and stuff like that. And so I got, I got up late. Okay, and so it's probably 8 a.m. at this point, and um, I have not prayed for the partners. I haven't meditated the word, um, and I'm up, I'm, th I'm behind, okay? Uh, Coco was going to be there at 9, and so maybe it was Friday. And so um, I'm, I've got all this stuff I have to do. And I'm thinking of, I need, to, I, would, I, I, would, I, I need to get Victoria up. I need to feed her. I need to give her vitamins. Uh, I need to sit and play with her a little bit, do our morning prayers and all this other stuff. And so I'm, I'm trying to get all this together. And I thought, no, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to pray for the people first. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to spend some time on the Word. Now, I'm sitting in that chair foc tr focusing on these scriptures that we pray over you all every day. And everything in me wants to get up. Everything in me wants to go uh, clean up the kitchen a little bit. Everything in me wants to go start, start these things. Are y'all? Yes. Um, I, I, listen, I'm the pastor's pastor, so if I can say it, y'all can say it. You're, you're sitting there, and, and it's like, I have things to do. I don't have time to do this. Maybe I could get back to this at the end of the day, but right now I have things that must be done. Amen. So I'm having this struggle in my flesh. And then I had to remind myself, no, I don't need anything as bad as I need this. I need nothing. That Jesus specifically said, there is one thing needful. Now my flesh is saying, no, we don't need to do this. We need to fulfill our list. Right? I need to get this, this, and this. That way I'll feel good about myself that I've accomplished these things. And I'm going to caution the type A people. You know you who saying? you are. Because you, you have to get everything checked off on your checklist. Nothing can move over tomorrow. You have to get it all done, and you have to get it done now, and you have a time schedule, and it has to be done exactly. And you are the people the devil targets to get off track. Okay, now, don't, don't get me wrong. He tries for all of us. But the type A, that's one of the techniques the devil's going to use, right? Because he tells you that what you're doing has no value. Because ultimately, what the, the devil was trying to convince me, my flesh as well, was this has no value praying for these people. This has no value meditating the word. The value comes in what you're about to do. And I had to bring my mind, because right now, I'm trying to think something different. I had to get a hold of my mind and say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm sitting right here. This is a thing of the greatest value. This is what will help me deal with all of that. Mm -hmm. This is what helps make me a good daddy. This is what helps make me a good minister. This is what helps me be a good husband and a good man. Nothing has priority over this. This will change me. Amen. Now, I did not feel that way. My soul, my mind, my will, and my emotions was still going, No! Get to the list. That's important. And, but, but see, if I'm going to truly renew my mind, if I'm truly going to do these things, because we're all in the process, right? I have to grab a hold of that 
and say, no, this is what I'm acting on. Are you with me? I have to give attention to these words. I have to incline my ear unto these sayings. And, and there's a difference between doing it and giving attention to it. Mm-hmm. Anybody else ever been on autopilot? Yeah. yeah, we get on autopilot, right? It's just what we do. You, you can say scriptures on autopilot. We have prayed over our dinner before and looked mm-hmm. at each other and say, did we pray? So, because we were on autopilot. So the question is, how much faith did you really release? Was your heart really in that prayer? We have to, and again, we're the pastors, so it's okay. Right. But we have to engage our heart in what we're doing. We can't just do it because that's what we do. We have to engage our heart. That's when things change. There's an expectation for things to be different because now we've engaged our heart with the one true power. And this goes into the incline your ear to what he's saying because you can give attention, you could focus on the reading, but you're not actually hearing what he's saying. You have to, you know, this is something that Jesus said, and we'll, we'll, maybe we'll get into this later, uh, but he asked, the, he asked the Pharisees, what does the word say and how do you read it? Because it wasn't just what did the word say. It was how do you read it? What do you hear when you read it? And see, when we get into the Word, that's one of the things we have to do is I'm not just, I'm not here just to read. I'm here to listen. That I will hear from Him. That God will speak to me. That God will cause me to know and to understand. I'm I'm listening. When, how many times have you read a scripture and it meant one thing to you? And then you come back later a different, different day, different, different circumstance going on in your life, and it means so much more, right? And, and God ministers to you through his word, and he prepares our hearts for things to come as well. And so it, it becomes a timely word. Not only that, the more you're listening while you're reading, the easier it becomes to hear later. Because the, the voice of the word in your spirit will be the same voice that speaks to you when you need an answer. Amen. Okay. So when you incline your ear into saints, do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. You got to keep, you got you to gotta stay with it. And then you have to keep it at the middle of you. That everything is, in, is seen in light of that. You have to keep the word in the midst of your heart because sometimes we kind of move it around. Like the word is in the way. So we're going to move the word off to the side so we can do this. Am I the only person in here that does this stuff? No, it's like like, this is what the word says. Listen, okay, let's go back to me sitting there fighting my flesh on Friday. Why don't we just take the word that says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let's just take that. Let's just move that out of the way. And let's seek all this other stuff first, and then we'll add this in later. I'm just going to take it out of the, I'm going to move it, right? And I'm going to put this at the middle. The middle of my day, the middle of what I'm doing, the middle of what I'm thinking, the middle of how I'm interacting with my wife, the middle of how I'm interacting with my daughter, the middle of, the middle of how I'm interacting with all these things. How many of you have, at times put your feelings in the midst of a relationship and put your feelings in the middle of the relationship rather than the Word of God in the relationship? There should have been more hands up. That or I need to cast out a bunch of liars. Um... <laughs> Because I've done it a lot, right? Where all I'm all I'm thinking about is what I feel, what I feel in this moment, the way I'm feeling at this moment, and I want to deal with this problem according to my feelings. But I can't keep the the feelings in the midst of my heart. I have to keep the word in the midst of my heart to help me deal with the feelings and with this. Let me ask you a question. How many times have you kept your feelings in the midst of this and made this go horribly wrong with what you said? 
that you spoke in light of your feelings, that you spoke in light of the way you felt rather than in right of who you were and the way you actually felt. Right? I'm angry right now, so I'm speaking on behalf of anger. I'm not speaking on behalf of love. Because right now I've, I'm, I'm keeping the anger in the midst of me rather than the, what the Bible says about that I have the love of God shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. But I'm angry right now, and I'm going to act on the anger because that's what I have in the midst of me right, right now, right. not what he said. And then I speak in anger. And now what was a small problem has now become a bigger problem. Has this only happened to me? And this, this is what we have to do. We have to, oh, wait a minute, wait, wait. This is the way I'm feeling. But this, the word says the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so I am not going to act on wrath. I'm going to act in kindness. I'm going to act. Because if this is wrong, it'll be just as wrong tomorrow. And I can let loose of the feeling. We, we have a commitment. One of the things we do with Victoria is we never discipline her in anger. We discipline her because it's right and there's wrong. So if we're so angry that we can't discipline her correctly, we don't discipline her. We wait because to, it'll still be wrong tomorrow. Right? And so that's, but you've got, again, that's keeping the word in the midst. Well, she doesn't, you know, she, the way she spoke to me, she doesn't love me. And now, now you're allowing your feelings. You're focusing it on your hurt. And so now you start giving place to depression rather than you could go back to the fact that I've been made accepted in the beloved. It, really, regardless of what she's doing, I'm not yielding to depression because somebody far greater than her loves me. Somebody far greater than her appreciates me. Somebody far greater than her. And so why am I going to allow my day to be destroyed because she's having a bad day? Right? Keep the word in the midst of your heart. That's what you, you have to keep your eye on that. Now, except for the last example, all the other examples were things that when you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, they're not wrong, right? It's not wrong to want to get those check marks for the list that you have for the day. That's not wrong. It's not wrong for you to want to do all the things that you need to get done. It's not wrong. But what's wrong is shifting your attention solely to that and off the Lord. What's wrong is taking that from taking the word from the midst. The word cannot share the midst. The word needs to remain in the midst Amen. of your heart. Amen. Right? And so so we are keeping first place first. So, and that's where sometimes it's like, yeah, but, uh, but, but I wasn't doing anything wrong. Right. You weren't doing anything wrong, but you have to understand this is what's right. Does that make sense? Yeah, you can do the right thing with the wrong priority. Uh, when I walk in the house, I kiss my wife first, then I kiss my daughter. The reason is I want her to know that the priority in this relationship is my wife is first, she is second. I want her to know that I, I want her to see that I love her mother and that I value her. And so there, there's a priority. There's a way that you do things. There is a way to put the word first. It's not that we won't. I got to this other stuff. My daughter has eaten since Friday, right? Um, she, she's been dressed since Friday and, and stuff. She, we got to the other stuff. It just was in the proper order. But we're very quick. Let, let me ask you this. Um, how many of you have found at times work was inconvenient to what you wanted to do? <laughs> right? Right? Now, and you thought, you had this thought, you know what? If I just quit going to work, I could do all this other stuff. Yeah. And then you thought, but if I quit going to work, I won't be living in a house very soon. I won't be eating very much very quickly. And so, even though you had a want, you realized, i got to get this done because this is what makes sure I have clothes on my back, food on my table, and I have a house over my, a roof over my head. Because you understand and saw the need of it. 
Right. Okay. You need to get to the place that you value the word of God that way. That I value that more than I value the work. I value that. That does not mean I'm taking off from work today because I didn't read my Bible this morning. It means that what you've got to do is you've got to begin to elevate that word that I need this more than I need anything else. That this literally affects every aspect of my life because most of the time when we get behind, one of the first things we want to cut out is our time with God, Mm -hmm. our time in His Word, and fellowshipping. We're going to set that aside so we can accomplish this other stuff. That is that when you identify that, you need to pull that back in and say no. No, there is only one thing that is life to me, for I have found it. There's only one thing that is health and healing to all my flesh, and it is not all of this other stuff. And so I'm going to prioritize that because I literally believe that by doing this, it will be life to me, for I have found it, and it will be health to all my flesh. Amen. Are are you with me? Yes. Okay. For they are life to those who find them and health to all of their flesh. Verse 23, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. And that was our key uh, key off scripture last week, right? We have to tend to our heart because if we do not tend to our heart, then it doesn't matter. That's I, that's, I've come to the conclusion that's how so many people are deceiving themselves. They're not tending to the condition of their hearts. They're allowing bitterness. They're allowing, you know, all kinds of emotions. They're allowing things, experiences to affect the condition of their heart. And then even though they're reading the word, even though they're planting the word, even though they're giving the word what they believe is first place, right? Because they believe they're giving the word first place. But all these other things are in the midst of their heart instead of the word, and then because we're not keeping our heart with all diligence, we're having other things flow out of our heart rather than the outcomes that we're expecting. We're deceiving ourselves. You ever, you, if you don't deal with different things, bitterness, unforgiveness, all that stuff comes up later. Pride, pride you're right, everybody else is wrong, you're angry with them, won't speak to them and stuff like that. Um, moving right along. Now, here's the thing. Once you have to protect your heart because out of it, it says the issues of life. Some, some things says forces of life. It also literally can mean boundaries, come the boundaries of your life. In other words, the way you're, as a man thinks in his heart so easy, is he? You, by what you keeping in your heart, you will set boundaries for yourself. Even with the word. Here, let me, sh- let me show you a story here. Uh, go with me to uh, Mark chapter 4. Now, we're going to read um, in verse um, 23 and 24, in t- uh, 20, 23 through 25. If anyone has he- ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said to them, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has... To him more will be given, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Okay, notice that God does not believe in socialism, right? Completely against it. He is that you could have more and be given more and you could have less and he's going to take that from you because you're not doing anything with it. Yeah, moving right along. We knew Um, that would be popular. Yeah, uh, yeah, people have all these weird ideas. Um, but that's not God. That's not how God works. Now, he, here's something, and now this I want you to get contextually. This is what he says to them. Whatever you hear, take heed, take heed what you hear with the same measure you, you, you use, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear more will be given. Now, I, I want to do a contextual thing of this story because of what happens. Jesus ends up teaching the parable of the sower. And he starts explaining about the parable of the sower. And he says, listen, the, the, the son of man, I sow the word. That's what I sow. Now, when, once I give you the word, you've got to make a decision to let it penetrate. 
You have to make a decision to keep acting on it so that there's roots. You have to make sure that you deal with the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things, or else it's going to choke the word and it's going to become unfruitful, right? And then this word will produce 30, 60, and 100 fold. And then he begins to explain this is the way the whole kingdom of God operates, and this is the way it works. Then he says, now remember this, he tells them, the way you measure it out, it is going to be measured back to you. There is, this is how you set boundaries for your heart. When you read the word, however far you measure it is the boundary. Okay, let me, let me explain what happens to them. So, end of the day, and it specifically says on the same day. He, now he tells them. He tells them, we do, God, the Father does things through His Word. You spend time in the Word. You've got to contend for the Word. This, he does things through His Word. And what you hear, what you hear, though how far you measure it out is how far it will be measured back to you. So then He says to them, let us, go, let us get into the boat and go to the other side. So He tells them, this is what I want to do and this is what we're doing. They get out there and a storm comes up. Now, technically, they have his word on what to do. Let us go to the other side. He gave them that word. He told them specifically what to do. Much like God told Moses, go, go, go to the promised land. And then when he got to the Red Sea and he starts freaking out, he goes, I didn't tell you to stop. What are you crying to me for? Just because there's a sea? Yeah, keep walking. Keep walking. So what happens is, is all of a sudden a storm comes up and everything starts going wrong. They wake Jesus up. He speaks to the storm and they freak out. Like, who is this man that even the wind of the sea obey? And he's looking at them and says, what's your problem? Why don't you have any faith? In other words, when I told you about the word and what the word could do and I gave you the word, why didn't you hold on to the word? Why did you feel the need to wake me up? Because they didn't measure it out that far. They didn't understand that his words would stop storms. He, they didn't understand that his word would preserve their life. And so since they didn't measure it out that far, it didn't work that far. See, now think about how Jesus measured the word out. The word literally can cause and do anything. It can completely violate the laws of physics. If my boys are in trouble and they need me, I can, instead of me walking to the water and stopping and say, I wish I could help, then I will just walk on the water. That's how far he measured it. He measured it that if I have the word from the Father, I can stop the storm. If I've got the word from the Father, then I can heal the sick. That's how far I measure this out. Now, see, we measure the word as well. Sometimes we measure it to, let's take healing for example. I believe that when the doctors treat me that I, this will be the end of it. That's how far you've measured it. You believe that God wants you healed. We want to, we're going to do that. So you measured it out that far. Bravo. Uh, that's awesome. Right. And, and, and that's why we ask you, what, what will you believe so that we can bring ourselves into agreement with where you are? We're not, we, we, we will respect and honor anywhere where someone is. There's nothing wrong with that. There's more available. No. And so if you, okay, let's take this. We're with healing, so the doctors will help me, right? So, so the doctors, will, okay, we're in agreement. The doctors will treat you and you'll be fine, okay? All right. But then, and as long as you truly believe that in your heart. But right. then, uh, well, I believe that, um, that uh, soon I'll be free from this. Okay, define soon. Because mm -hmm. soon gets put off, right? I believe that when you lay your hands on me, I will be made whole. Okay, all of those is how far you're measuring it. Right. Let's, take, let's take another scripture about protection, right? Um, uh, that you will tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. How far do you measure it? Is it that um, if I, if I, in a fender bender, I won't have neck problems? Is it if, if, I, if I got hit by a Mack truck that I walk away completely unscathed? Is it that if I was in a plane and it blew up in the air, I will still be fine? Is it if I was in a city where they nuked me? 
What, that I would be the one that lived. How far do you measure it? Where do you measure it? Because see, what happens is, is that we, we, we're not really looking at our measure. Right. And it's not the measure of our faith. It's how far you can see it. Mm-hmm. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you, if you, t- the, 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 um, if in your mind that nothing shall by any means harm you, the furthest you can go is, is if he's got a gun, he won't be able to draw it. Or if he's got a gun, it won't go off. Or if he's got a gun and he shoots, that the bullets will either pass through me, uh, go around me, something. Right? How far do you measure it? You say, well, I don't believe that. I get it. I get it because you haven't measured it that far. But there are some people that have measured it that you can throw them into a fiery furnace seven times hotter than it's ever been. And they walk out of there not just well, but without the smell of smoke on their clothes with all the bondages removed. Amen. That, that just, and, and you can't sit there and say, that's crazy. No, it's crazy to you because you won't measure it that far. But you could start. Right. You could start measuring it. You could start keeping it in the midst of your heart. You could start protecting your heart and increasing the boundary. Figure out where you are, where you choke. Start working on that. And then once you no longer choke on that, move it out a little bit further. Amen. Amen. Right? It's according to the measure. The problem, people say, well, I just... Nothing, nothing's really happening because me- you don't really see God bigger than your problem. So your measure's not real big. Amen. Am I the only person in here that's ever magnified the problem over, the, over, the, over God? I just taught on this on television the other day. And it was really good because when he, when he talked about it, you know, because people have this question, how do you make God bigger? And he used the illustration with the magnifying glass. If you look at something, the item does not become bigger, but it is bigger to you. And so we have to magnify the Lord and make him bigger to us than our problem is. You're increasing the measure because according to the measure you meet, it will be measured back to you. Amen. And so if you only see God is able to do this, that's all he's going to be able to do. Right. People say, no, God is unlimited. <laughs> according to the measure you meet... It'll be measured back to you. Your prosperity is not according to God. It's according to you. Mm -hmm. Given it shall be given unto you again. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. In other words, but what's that first measure? Give. Give. Well, if I give according to the measure you meet, it'll be measured back to you. What's my measure? I could could come in here and bring a a teaspoon. But you bring a shovel. Your harvest is going to be greater than mine. God's not in control of that. I am. It was depending on what I did with the, what my, what was my measure. I measured it out and he measured it back to me. Amen. And see the problem, what we need to do is, is start today measure. Okay. And I, and I guess we got to close, right? Um, You got to, you got to receive the offerings. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. When I first got started um, in my walk of faith, um, I, I, I almost got killed around my birthday within two weeks every year that I can remember. Okay, it was either explosions, car accidents, uh, gunfire. I mean, there was just a bunch. Okay, it, within two weeks of my birthday, as long as I can remember, I would almost die. With, so two weeks before, two weeks after. Okay, so... Plus, I was, I was doing high-risk stuff. And so I, one of the first things I wanted to do is I want to learn how to, to, that I'm not going to die, right, in all this crazy stuff that keeps happening, okay? I see in here that um, it, according to the measure you meet, it'll be measured back to you. And I see where you must sow the word. So I started getting protection scriptures out. And one was one I quoted to you this morning, is Luke 10, 19 that I shall tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means, so nothing can harm me, and no means can harm me. Nothing shall by any means. Okay? So I sat down in a chair and started thinking about, I actually started thinking about ways that people would seek to harm me. And I think the first one was probably a knife. Right? 
And that, you know, I, I started seeing, the first I started seeing a guy stabbing me and me missing, the, missing it. And so it, it hits my skin. And first couple times, man, he stabbed me good and I just died. Right? Because I'm not measuring it out very far. I'm not seeing the word is true. On the inside of me, I'm still seeing that this knife is bigger than God. Don't, don't look at me so spiritual. Right? No. There's time. That one of the reasons you worry is because you think something's bigger than God. Okay, so I'm sitting here, and I, he stabs me, and I die. Now, eventually, I got to where, okay, you can't get the knife in. Nothing. Okay, nothing. No knife. Shall by any means. So it doesn't matter whether he slashes or whether he stabs. Nothing shall by any means harm me. Now, I can think about that mentally, but I don't see that on the inside. And my, as I think in my heart, so am I. Are you with me? So then I, I, have, I sit here and I'm like, okay, okay. So now, okay, I can see it. I can see it. I'm not dying. Praise God. You know, at first it was like I'd get cut, but it wouldn't be bad and, and, and all this. So then I'm, okay, now a gun. So a guy points a gun at me. First thing I could see is the gun wouldn't go off. Okay, that was the only way I could see this working. I could not see God being bigger than bullets. I'm just being honest, right? So if the guy pulls the trigger, I get hit. So the, uh, the only way this is going to work, the gun doesn't go off. So I just keep meditating. I keep measuring. Now, as I'm meditating, my faith in his word and understanding how powerful he is and what his word can do grows, right? And the first time that I remember a guy pulling a gun on me after that, meditating, he could not, that's what happened. He pulled the trigger and the gun didn't go off. He'd shot several other people, but he wasn't able to shoot me. And so I'm like, praise God, okay? Um, and then uh, the next thing, I started meditating on it. So the gun does go off, but the gun, but the bullet um, goes around me. It doesn't, it doesn't hit me, right? And, and stuff. So now I didn't have this happen with a gun, but what did happen is I was in a, in a building one time and a hurricane was going on, and we heard this rattling, and I went to go see what the rattling was, and it was a plate glass thing in the building and stuff, and the, the, all of a sudden, the window blew in with me right in front of it, and I didn't get hit by anything. Everything that came in with the window went around me and was laying in a pattern behind me. Because, but it's a measuring thing. And so I just kept measuring that out. And then I get beyond guns. I get beyond knives. I get beyond explosives. I get to planes in the air. What happens if, you know, uh, if I'm on an airplane? Because that was the biggest thing. I thought there's no way you could live through this. And I had to meditate on the word until I could see myself living through that. But I'm, I'm constantly measuring. Now, many of you say, yeah, there's no way you could live through a plane blowing up in the air. I get it. I get it. Because you're still down at this lower measure. Right? You can't see it yet. And I, to be honest, it depends on the day. Sometimes I see it, sometimes I don't. How about you? Yes. But the thing of it is, is we keep working on that measure because this is how we keep the word in the midst of our heart. This is how we, how we make a decision that we protect your heart for out of it flow these boundaries. If you're putting boundaries on God because you're not seeing him bigger than your problem, Amen. And again, go back to be honest with yourself. Don't tell me what you're saying. Don't tell me what just what you're thinking. Tell me about your worry. Because that worry is being generated from on the inside of your heart somewhere. You're not thinking in light of the promise being bigger. So you need to go back and attack it. You need to go back and attack it and say, God is bigger than this, and I'm going to meditate on it till I see him bigger than this. Amen. Right? I'm going to meditate on it. I'm going to extend the boundary. I'm going to keep my heart for out of its spring, the boundaries of life. In my heart right now, I, I've, I've set up a boundary to God, and I'm going to extend. Mm -hmm. In finances, some of you can't, can't see yourself being debt-free. Cannot see a life without debt. You want it, you desire it, but you can't see it. You set a boundary. Mm -hmm. And so what you have to do is get into the word and move the boundary. Amen. Amen. 
allow God to be that big. This is one of the problems that the Pharisees had. They put Jesus in a boundary and they could never saw him for who he was. He's doing, people say, well, if I saw a miracle, they saw miracles every time they were around him and wouldn't let it go. Because they'd set up this boundary and said, this is as far as we'll allow God to be. This is as big as we'll allow God to be. This is all that we will allow him to be. And they were limited. Amen. Keep your heart, for out of it spring the issues of life. Amen. Amen? Amen. Did y'all get something out of this today? Yes. All right. I'm going to go love on the kids while Pastor Kurt receives the offering. I love y'all. Love you. All right. Did y'all get something out of that? Yes. Listen, I'm not going to teach on this at great length today, um, but I'm going to, um, I want to show you something here because I've said it a few times and sometimes people, here, here's the thing. If we're ever saying something and we're referring to something you don't know, you are welcome to ask us about it. Because the whole point of these services is for you to walk out of here and be able to live it. That's what it's about. And so I've made a statement several times that trusting money is the least thing in the kingdom of God. But some of you have not understood what I was saying and wondering where I got it. So I'm going to show you. Okay? And I'm not, again, I'm not going to teach extensively on this. I'm just going to show it to you. And verse, uh, this is uh, Luke 16.1. Then he said to his disciples, there was a certain man who had a, a, a steward and had an accusation brought to him that he was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be a steward. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking away the stewardship from me. I cannot dig, I am ashamed to beg, I, am, I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he said to every one of his master's debtors, and said to, uh, uh, said to the first, how much do you owe the master? And he said to him, a hundred measures of uh, oil. And he said to him, take your bill, sit down and write 50. Then he sat down, and anyway, he, he does this. In verse, 18, in verse 8, he says, So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in this generation than the sons of light. Now notice what Jesus says next. And I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, that literally means when you die, that's what it means, okay? Uh, most of your Bibles will have a little le letter there. Mine has a little letter. Mine's an A, right? And it says, uh, <clears throat> in, uh, that when, when you die, then it says this. It says, um, I say to yourself, make for, your sins, for yourself friends of unrighteous mammon, that when you die, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Now, again, that's everlasting home. Now, what he's talking about, and I'll teach on this at some length, is that when you give, when you give for the gospel's sake, when you give, bring your tithes and offerings, when you give offerings... You are making it possible for every person in here. When you tithe, you're making it possible. Every effect that the word had today in somebody's life, you were responsible for. If you're tithing and make it possible for the lights to be on, the doors to be open, and everything, you were making that possible. Okay? And as, Curtis, we received the building fund, as we are getting another uh, little classroom outside and the different things that we do here, you're making it possible for people to come. Right, And so you're making for yourself friends. It, what it means to receive you in an everlasting home, and again, I'll teach in this at some length, but basically when you leave this earth, every, every person that was changed by the way you used your money for the kingdom of God in the earth, when you get to heaven, if they're already, if they're already gone, they will thank you. Every per like for here, because of KOM and stuff, there's literally people from around the world they are going to walk in and say thank you when you get to heaven. They will receive you into your everlasting home. That's what he's talking about. I don't have time to get deep into it, right? But, so he goes on here and he says this. He said, now notice what he says in verse 10, talking about money. He who is faithful in what is is." Uh, is, least, is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in what is much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you true riches? Now that's an interesting question. He calls it least, and he calls it, it, it is the least thing. If, if, if you are not faithful in money, if you don't trust God in money, what can you trust God for? Right? 
This is the least test. Now, one of the reasons it's the least test, and I don't have time to get into this, but the love of money is the root of all evil. So what the reason God wants you to, do, to trust Him, bring your tithes and offerings, is so that you are consistently demonstrating, I don't love money, I love God. I don't trust money, I trust God. Amen. Constantly reminding you your money is not your source. Right. right? We need it, but it's not our source. But this is the least amount of uh, trust. Now, and, and, okay, here's the thing. If you don't think God can pay your bills after you've honored Him with the 10%, Right? And brought offerings, because you should be, at least be 11%, right? Tithes is what is, is he, he asks for. Everything after that, you get to choose, right? And you want to at least do 1%, because you want to be in the offerings category. There's certain things that are only promised to offerings, right? So if you can't trust him in that, do you, do you really think you can trust him to heal cancer? If you don't trust him in that, do you really think, I mean, are, how sure are you that you're saved? People say, what do you mean? And again, this is not buying those things. But if I can't trust God, that if I give him 10% of my income plus an offering, that he is going to be able to supply all of my needs plus more, then do I, how much can I really trust that a Jesus I've never met, never seen, died on a cross I've never seen, in a place I've never seen, and yet I'm still going to heaven? I'm not saying you don't. I'm saying it becomes difficult. How do you believe that God is going to take care of a cold? How do you believe that God is going to take care of what's going on in your family? If you can't, if we're not trusting him in that which is least. You know, I've seen people, and, and I, just so we're clear, I don't bind all this hogwash about bringing an offering and God will heal you. I don't, I don't bind all that trash, right? Freely we receive, freely give, right? Whether you tithe or not, God is, God is still in the healing business. It might be difficult for you to receive it, but it won't be because God's withholding it. I've watched people that when they finally got their heart right towards money, they were able to receive other things. They were able to receive their healing. Now, some people have misinterpreted that and said, well, you brought this offering and so God healed you. And some people got this confused. And, and, and the ministers that are honest, maybe that's where they got it. That's not what happened. What happened was is you settled the least issue and then it opened the door for you to trust more. You didn't buy your healing. That's not what happened. It's that you finally released your trust in that which was the least area. And then you got, listen, money is not true riches because there's plenty of money. There's plenty of people with money that cannot, or that die sick. Anybody ever met them, right? They got plenty of dough, right? They're, they're rolling in cash. They could fill their bathtub with it and swim around in it. But they're still going to die because they, don't, they can't receive healing. It's not true riches. You having money does not empower you. It, it's not to, to, to be born again, to be a child of God, or to minister salvation to someone else. What about boldness? There are things far more important that we walk in than money. But Jesus says, if you can't trust him in this least thing, who's going to make you master over much? Who will entrust to you true riches? And again, it's not with him withholding from you. So if you can't trust him in this, how do you go? It's, it's like trying to climb a ladder. If you can't put your foot on the first rung of the ladder, do you really think you're going to hit rung number three? Now, again, if you thought I taught this to get you to give, hold on to it till you get your heart right. I'm trying to explain to you, for the people who are wondering why I said that, this is why I said it. He warns us. He, wants, he tells us what money can do, and he tells us it's the least thing in the kingdom of God. But it's still part, it is still part of the kingdom of God. So I would encourage you, and again, if your heart is wrong and you're giving it, if you, think, if you feel guilty... I don't want you to give it because you're guilty. You need to give it in faith. I don't want you to give it in fear. Just so you know, if you don't tithe today, God is not going to go bust your washing machine and tear up your car. Right? It's not happening. He's not, go he, he's not in that business. Right? I, I, if you're going to tithe today, I want you to do it on the basis of, I trust you, not I'm scared of what you might do to me. Okay? But on the other side of it, and if you're having trouble with this, 
you need to start measuring out the financial promises in a greater measure and meditate on it till you can see it for your own sake. For your own sake. Amen? If you'd like an envelope for your giving, go ahead and raise your hand. If you're um, texting to give, text RLC. PSL to 44321. If you're watching online, you can go to Real Life PSL, and uh, there's a giving page there. Um, I'm not going to be here next Sunday. I thought I was. Um, I'm got a I catch a flight to Turkey. Uh, it was earlier than I thought. I thought it was at 6:30, but it's at noon. Um, y'all can be praying for us. This is going to be this is going to be probably a pretty amazing trip. I'm going to be teaching. Um, the Love of God Conference in an Iranian church and then in a Turkish church. I'll be right on the uh, border and things like that. So I believe that uh, people's lives are going to be changed. It, it, it's, it has been incredibly difficult sometimes people that were former Muslims to receive the love of God. That's a very hard concept sometimes for them to grasp. But I thank God for the grace on my life that I believe it's going to impart and change something. And all of you that are partners with Curdle Ministries or given to that, all of you, all those lives will be changed. Amen? Amen. All right. I want you to take, I want you to take two minutes. And I want you to just honor God with your tithes and offerings. It's not enough just to bring. I want you to release your faith and release your heart. Make sure you're not in fear. Right now, go ahead and do it. Father, we thank you. Lord, we honor that you are the source of all things. Lord, you are our God. Lord, all that we have, you are the one that's given it to us. Lord, thank you so much for everything you've done. Thank you so much for how you've helped us. Thank you so much for everything you've entrusted with us. Lord, we refuse to trust money and we refuse to trust things. Lord, we trust you. We trust you. Lord, we will be faithful in that which is least so that you can entrust to us two true riches. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. It is only by the breath that you have given us that we are even here today. Lord, that you are our help and you are our hope. We will not chase money. We'll chase you. Money is not first. You are first. Your word is first. Lord, we glorify you. Now, Lord, we're bringing our tithes and offerings. We celebrate you. Lord, we bring this to you, not out of fear, but out of gratitude and out of heartfelt belief that you have blessed us. And because we are blessed, we are blessed, we are a blessing. And Lord, not only by doing this will we not do without, but we'll have more than we ever have before and that we will pay every bill in full and on time because you have blessed us. You have blessed us. This is not a means of loss. This is gain to us. Because that's who you are to us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. All right, if you've honored God with your giving. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that your word says, here mortal men receives tithes, that's me. But there, there you receive it, whom it is testified that you live. That's you, our Lord Jesus. Lord, as we receive the tithes and offerings this morning, you receive them there. We command the blessing down upon them and everything that they have set their hand to. Lord Jesus, you have purchased this blessing for them. And Lord, we thank you that they, are, they have all things that pertain to life and godliness. And Father, I thank you and I command every bill to be paid in full with a balance of zero. I, Satan, you take your hands off of their harvest and I command it to come into them now in Jesus' name. And Lord, this is the smallest they'll ever tithe and the smallest they'll ever give because of your goodness in their life. And we will change lives all over the world as a church and as a ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, go ahead and receive the tithes and offerings and the people will be obedient to give. Remember to join us for some uh, fellowship and light snacks after the service. Did y'all get something out of this today? Yeah. Praise God. Now again, when you walk out of here, you got to do it. Find, find a problem in your life Get the scriptures on it and begin to measure those scriptures out. Are you with me? Measure them out. Begin to see yourself in light of that word being true. Right? Because it is true. That is ultimately who you really are. Receive it with meekness. Don't argue with it. Receive it. Amen? All right. Love on each other and we'll see you Wednesday night at 7 p.m.